Welcome to a day of prayer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Together, let's engage in relationship with Christ through prayer, faith, and His Word. Hello, I'm Luke Charles and you're listening to a day of prayers morning Bible study. We're glad you can join us. Before we get into the word, promise, can you open us up in prayer? Yes. Lord, I just thank you for today. I just ask that you come to a mission. I just thank you for just helping us with understanding your word and just making it where we can understand it and showing us a clear and concise way. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Well, amen. Good morning, everybody. And welcome. To our study in Romans and uh, our continuing of it. Uh, So we are moving on. We are are moving forward in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we're still in chapter 1, and we're going to cover verses 16 through 32, being a bit bold or ambitious. So i got to get a volunteer to read verses 16 through 32, please. I will. All right, Kyla. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his internal power, eternal, excuse me, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they were, they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts were dark, was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Mm. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than their creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passion, excuse me, degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for what, for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the man abandoned the natural function of the, of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of the error. And just as they did not see it, see fit to acknowledge God in any any longer, God gave them over to depraved minds to do those things which are not proper, being filled with an unrighteous, unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedience, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Amen. So there's a lot in here. (laughs) And um, so right before we started, we were discussing how there's, I'll say two thoughts, right? Verses 16 and 17, there's a, a slight segue from Paul's introduction, right? And his writing to the saints. He's still writing to the saints, obviously, but from the initial content that he wrote to the saints in Rome, discussing the gospel of Christ and faith. And then verses 18 through the end of the chapter, there's a second prevalent thought going into, uh, well, it's probably titled in your Bible something to the effect of God's wrath on the unrighteous, 
or unrighteousness. Okay? Yes. So there's there's a lot. A lot contained in here. There's a lot of, I'll say, discussion and a lot that clearly the Holy Spirit wants to speak and to minister to us about, right? Yes. And um, so at this point in time, we're going to open the floor up so you can ask any questions that you have and share whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking and ministering to you. All right? Yes. yes. Okay. So who would like to begin? I do. All right, Layla, go ahead. Um, I found it interesting how Paul had said that um, man had created images after themselves and in the likeness of four-footed creatures, so animals essentially, and how they were so willing to exchange the freedom of God for bondage, and they were um, so opposed to worshiping him that they would rather worship a animal that doesn't really do anything and just the things that they gave themselves up to just to be opposite to him for really um to no benefit and you, when you look at it you're like why would you do this why would you worship essentially like a dog or something like in the, in the, um how we consider things we as humans, we consider the animals to be beneath us, inferior. But in history and in today's age, we're worshiping these things that we would call inferior. Like if somebody asked you who would you think was higher, a dog or a person, you'd go the person. But here we are worshiping these animals that we consider inferior to us and trying to place them above God. So Paul said they were worshiping the created rather than the creator who was blessed forever and it's just um kind of like a, a mind blower if you will why they would give this away so easily instead of living in the goodness of god and in his freedom they rather willingly put themselves in handcuffs and chains and it doesn't quite make sense to me why. Okay. Well, there's a lot in there, right? And, and there are two thoughts here, right? Like I said, in the first couple of verses, he says how he's not ashamed of the gospel, right? There's that. It's a it's a thought, but it's also a segue to this bigger thing that he's trying to get to, which is helping people understand well we'll say it in this way Rome right has been known historically for a lot of drunkenness vileness debauchery sexual immorality all these things that came as a result of their worshiping pagan gods right that's that's been known throughout history right that's who he's writing to are is well to Rome to would be believers right he's setting the found, he set the foundation in Christ we covered that but now he's talking about the gospel of Christ right I'm saying very specifically specifically it's the power of salvation for everyone who believes right talking about faith everyone right Jew and Greek it doesn't matter he's saying Everyone can be saved, right? And then he continues through, well, talking about the, the wrath on the unrighteous. And what he's saying is actually, um, well, turn to Isaiah 28, please. Let's, let's go there. Isaiah 28? Yes. Mm -hmm. Verse 1. We're going to start in verse 14. I'm there. Okay. Um, yeah, let's read 14 through 19. Or, sorry, 14 through 22, please. Okay. 
Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers, who rule these people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have made a pact. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by. For we have made falsehood our refuge, and we have concealed ourselves with deception. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. And I will make justice the measuring line, and righteousness the level. Then hail shall sweep away the refuge of the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the secret place. You said 17, right? He said 22. No, through 22, please. Oh, I'm sorry. And your covenant with death shall be canceled, and your pact with Sheol shall not stand. When the overwhelming scorch passes by, then you will become its trampling place. As often as it passes through, it will seize you. For morning after morning, it will pass through. Any time during the day or night, and it will sheer, it will be sheer terror to understand what it means. The bed is too short on which to stretch out, and the blanket is too small to wrap oneself in. For the Lord will rise up as a mountain, as at Mount Perizim, and he will stir us up, stir up as in the valley of Gibeon, to do his task, his usual task, and to work his work, his extraordinary work. And now do not carry on as scoffers, lest you fed your fetters be made stronger. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts, a decisive destruction on all the earth. Hmm. Okay, so there, there's a lot in there, right? In both of these places. Do they not sound similar? Yes. Everything that Paul is describing in Romans, Isaiah, or the word of the Lord through Isaiah, is discussing the same thing. And at the core of it, it is choosing to believe a lie. And the lie, that's, that's verse 15 here, right? Isaiah 28, verse 15, right? They made a covenant with death, and it says, For we have made lies our refuge and hidden themselves under falsehood. Right? Uh, and that's just a continual thing. It's choosing to believe and to remain in the lie. Making that their stronghold. Because prior to this section of scripture, the Lord is encouraging them to hear the word of the Lord. Right? Which... Just like Paul is saying in verses 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is salvation for all who will believe. So in other words, right, all who will believe, have faith, go forth and do, right, apply to their lives all the things written, all the things the Lord has spoken and written to them and instructed us, them, Paul, the apostles, the church in Rome, or the Romans, but even us today, how we should live, how our lives, and walk, right? This is the walk of faith. Can't apply human or natural things to my life and expect to achieve God's results in my life. It is an impossibility, however well-intentioned they may be, however close they may sound to Scripture. They will not produce the fruit or the righteousness of God in your life. So, you Layla, brought up about idols and all those things, right? Yes. Let's go back to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Moses went up on the mountain. And then what happened? Uh, Aaron made a golden calf out of the people's gold. The people... I'll say beseeched Aaron and had him fashion a golden calf. Oh, yes, out of their own gold. And then they decided to worship the calf. How much sense does that make? Even though they had already seen and were experiencing the awesome power and manifestation of the glory of the Lord and the miracles and protection and all those things in their lives, in their, like, everyday lives mm -hmm. they chose to lie against the truth and you know in that 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 recount or that that testimony that we have written the uh, an important thought or um, detail is presented there 
Moses was gone too long. Right? Yes. He was gone too long, and they were tired of waiting. Basically. And they said, well, we don't know what's happening. Although he went up there with the Lord, we don't know what's happened to this man who brought us out. So now let us make our own God. And so there's an element of of all humanity to go, do we feel that God is taking too long? So now we have to make or preserve our own way. God is not giving us something that we want. So now we have to go take it for ourselves. That's no different than woman in the garden. Did God really say that? Well, they already had wisdom. They already knew the glory of God. What they did not know was unrighteousness. What they did not know was sin. So God is withholding from you. Get it for yourself. He's taking too long. You need to hurry up and get it now. So same component there because it says in verse 21, they knew God because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's the same thing as what happened to the children of Israel while they were waiting for Moses. They had gotten to a place of already complaining against the Lord. But when Moses wasn't there to watch over them, they said, oh, it's taking too long to hear whatever it is that God has to say. It's taking too long to get this counsel. It's taking too long. Mm -hmm. We need to make a way for ourselves. And we're all subject to that. I've, I've been impatient with the Lord. And been tempted to put my hand out Mm -hmm. and grasp something and get it for myself. Try to snatch it. Absolutely, yes. And in my life before Christ, I did that many a time. Even though I grew up knowing who God was, I was not sold out for him. I was not fully convinced or persuaded, but I knew better. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it'll take too long for me to do what God wants to do. So I got a plan. I'll go get it for myself. I'll go make this for myself. I'll do this, that, or the other without him. And I certainly reap the fruit thereof, but all of humanity, especially with the sin nature, is subject to being tempted by that. And it is for us today to resist that and make sure we are satisfied in our thoughts towards the Lord, that we think and speak well of him internally so that our thoughts don't become darkened and, um, we maintain that grateful attitude. We be thankful. We're we are to be thankful to the Lord, so that way we don't begin to grumble and complain and follow the same trail mm-hmm. that others that have gone before us, um, in particular the Romans that he was talking about, have followed. Absolutely, and and there's a, a second aspect to that, mm. uh, and I love how you brought that up, honey. Right, well, being patient and waiting on the Lord, not mm. trying to forge our own way. Mm. But the other thing that we can, I'll say understand from that is the lack of their own personal and intimate relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. They had a relationship through Moses. Some might call that a secondhand anointing, Mm -hmm. right? They are being fed off of the, the overflow of the Lord pouring out his grace and mercy and, and anointing on Moses's life. They didn't have it for themselves or, or they refused to take, to take that for themselves, right? Which is why they were, looking to the man instead of to the Lord who is there and purposed just like he does today to have his own relationship with each and every individual on the earth. So when then the man was gone, now what did they have? They had what they fashioned, but we're instructed against that as well. Um, you please turn to Isaiah 44 and it begins in verse nine. And I don't know that we will read the whole thing, but I'll give you the verses, um, the address, <laughs> if you will, of this set of scripture so that you can read it and study it in your own time. It's Isaiah 44, verses 9 through 20. Thank All right. you, dear. Um, but for right now, let's just read 9 through 11. Can I get a volunteer to do that? I will. All right, Kyla. And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. Those who fashion a graven, a graven image are all, of them, are all of them futile. And their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know. So that they will be put to shame. Who has fashioned a God or cast an idol to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame. For the craftsmen themselves are there, are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. 
let them together be put to shame. Mm-hmm. And, and it continues. But also, it was, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll, as a result of time, I'll let you study that and read that on your own. But verse 20 ends, right? He feeds on ashes, a deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Mm. So because they have chosen to believe in the lie, chosen this, this refuge, or to put their refuge, make the lie their refuge, their place that they go to and turn to, they're unable to see and hear and to know, right? But if you study out Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, you see the result of why, right? It's sin. They chose to lie against the truth, right? And all the, I'll say the people in Scripture that end up being condemned, Mm -hmm. right? Exchanged, and, and Paul's writing about it here in Romans, right? They exchanged the truth for a lie. So they chose to believe a lie over the truth. And over what was profiting them and blessing them and benefiting their lives. And that matters to us today. Mm -hmm. And what's the lie? Can we talk about what the lie is? Please, yes. Look back at verse 17. Which which part? Because we covered a lot of different scripture. Romans 1, verse 17. (laughs) Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Thank you, honey. It says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Here's the lie. I can't trust God. In the garden, was it? Can you trust what God really said to you? Right. Did He really say that? Can you can yes. you take His word for it? Can you trust that He's going to complete this matter? Can you trust God? Can you really believe what God said? And that's ultimately the question that we face every day. But the Bible says that um, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen. And those that come to Him must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So. God has asked us to believe him. And in 1 John, the, the commandment, um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is transitioned to you shall believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And the commandment that we see in Matthew, but also in the Old Testament of you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is then transitioned to you shall love the brethren as he gave us commandment. So they're, the, they're likened in the same, but described with different, or art- articulated with different words. But without faith, without believing that Jesus is exactly who he said he is, which was already been, you know, testified or re- mm-hmm. restated at the beginning of this chapter, without that, you will believe anything. You won't trust God. Oh, you are who you say you are. You are a good God, abounding in mercy and truth, um, keeping, I'm sorry, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for generations exactly who god said he is do you trust him can you really believe what god says is he telling you the truth and so when we go well no i can't trust him that's the lie that hinges that every other lie from the enemy hinges on that god is not trustworthy when in fact he absolutely is and we can trust him we should trust him we can put our faith in him and then once we have that foundational truth now we can build all the other truths you are exactly who you say you are jesus you are you have been raised from the dead you know um thomas when the other disciples came and said we've seen the lord and he said i will not believe unless i put my my hand my fingers in the nail prints in his hand and i put my fist into his side i will not believe and jesus said to him when, when Jesus was finally revealed to him, Thomas said, oh, my Lord and my God, I believe you. And Jesus said, you believe because you've seen. Mm-hmm. But blessed are those who believe who have not seen. Which is faith. Which is and trust. also what we are called to, right? The walk of faith. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is also what Christ is searching for, right? And he says this in Luke 18, 8, right? Um, I'll read the whole scripture, but it's really the second half of this verse. He says, I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. Right? But this is the part that matters. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on or upon the earth? So will he find people that believe his word, believe what he has spoken, Mm -hmm. and applying it, diligently carrying it out? Amen. Delighting in doing his work, his will, not our own. Trusting his word enough to rest on it. You have something, Dean? 
Well, you know, I, I've shared with you guys that uh, you know, God gave me something many years ago. It was, it was um, a statement, and it's distance creates distortion. Mm-hmm. Mm. And um, it took me a long time to kind of figure out what he was talking about that. It mostly applies to relationship mm-hmm. and mostly applies to relationship with um, the people that I employ and making sure that um, if – an offense happens or if a misunderstanding happens, mm-hmm. we do everything we can to get restoration as quickly as possible because yeah. the longer that gets in between the relationship, the, it creates distance. And the more mm-hmm. distant we become, the more distorted it becomes. It's no mm-hmm. different than if we look at people in another country and they're, they just had an earthquake or they just had a whatever. We feel very distant from that. We don't feel real connected to it. It's mm-hmm. easy to dismiss it. Mm-hmm. And not try to do anything, but if our next door neighbor has a problem, right, or someone in our family, mm-hmm. we don't have that. And so, um, you know, the the enemy only wants just a little bit in between us and God, uh, because once that distance comes in, where it takes us, right? Mm-hmm. Adam and Eve immediately mm-hmm. hid, right? They mm-hmm. they you know here's God, who, they get this joy walking in the garden in the cool, literally walking in with Lord. God in yes. the garden. I mean, with no separation. <sighs> Yes, yes, not even clothing between you and him. Yes. Right, or between each other. Yes, amen. Right? Amen. So just this wonderfulness. So, um, so you know, uh, uh, Layla, y- you were kind of asking why, right? Why would they do this? And um, um, I'm, not, I'm not making an endorsement of a person that's very difficult in today's age. Um, when, you, when you talk about somebody, um, because, um, you know, we, we, we live in a time where there's fallen leaders. Right, but there to, mm-hmm. for what for me there was a good um, message from a guy named Vody Bacham about the world, the flesh, and the devil. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that he put in there, and and it's true for me, so I can I can only express my own opinion. But he said, sin is fun, sin feels good, and our flesh likes to sin, and because it, it feels good to our flesh. And so you were, Kamisha, you were talking about what we can trust. We also we can't trust. We can't trust our flesh. That's right. You certainly can't we, trust we, the devil. <laughs> we can't. We can't trust our flesh. Well, mm-hmm. obviously we can't trust the devil. But we yeah. really can't trust our flesh, and our flesh pulls into our feelings and everything else. Mm-hmm. The scripture I, tells us it's an enmity. It's at war with God and the things of God. Right. Mm-hmm. I I am not saying the Bible says this. Just in in my, I guess in my imagination, in a way, I just can't help but think that. You know, and here's Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And and in this moment, there is no sin has entered into the world, right? And here's the serpent um, coming to speak to Eve. So to me, first and foremost, um, I, I can't help but believe Adam didn't understand his role, right? She was created to be his helpmate. Why was she in front? Why was he not immediately... Who are you talking to my wife? You need to shut your trap. You're not going to interfere here in my relationship with my wife. So he didn't step into his role. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think that there had been consideration in their minds. What would it be like to have this fruit? So it was easy for Satan to tempt them because their flesh had already been there in that. And that's, that's the way I perceive it. So to, to the why, for me, Layla, it's, it's, it's because... My flesh wants it, and if I'm honest about that, it's much easier for me to deal with it and understanding that, because that's when I take all thoughts subject to Christ in that and have to put that filter there. Without that, I'm just as prone to cast a golden calf as anyone else. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's why we're continually encouraged throughout Scripture to buffet our flesh, to bring it in, into under control and into submission to the will of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's for everybody. Everybody, right? And you even see that with Christ. Not my will, but your will be done, right? Knowing what he was about to to endure and, and undertake to be pleasing to the Father, right? That's for all of us to, to get under control. Now, is it easier when you're surrounded by believers? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. That are all have the... Well, like it says in Acts, right? Before they had received the Holy Spirit, they were all in one mind and one voice or in one accord. Mm-hmm. Right? So if there, yes. if you can surround yourself with believers like that, it definitely makes things e- easier because then there is also, 
right? That, that same mind, one accord, to pursue and to mature in the things of Christ, all right? And there's encouragement and admonishment and, and equipping and all those other things that help build us up, right? However, it doesn't take away from our individual and personal role. We have to choose to be pleasing to Christ, to glorify Him in everything that we do, to give Him preeminence or mm-hmm. the first place and submit to Him. Amen. Allow Him to be who He is. He's our God. We are His people, right? And Paul makes that very clear at the beginning. I'm a bond servant of Christ. Mm-hmm. And in other places, he says that you can't be a bond servant and please men. One has to win out over the other. Right? Christ said that himself. You cannot serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other. Mm-hmm. So, whichever one we love more is the one we will follow. Wherever our heart is, there our treasure is also. Amen. Right? Yes. So, who has your heart? And that's a question for each of us to answer individually. I'm not saying we're going to do that. You're right. Mm. Um not mm-hmm. trying to put anybody on blast, right? If there's conviction, that's not because of me. That's the Holy Spirit ministering to you. So, so I would encourage you, listen to the Holy Spirit. Bring things into alignment. Mm-hmm. Repent if you must. If he's convicting you, then, then please repent. Bring it before him. Come back into alignment with, with him, with our mm-hmm. Heavenly Father and his will yeah. for our lives. And each of us has to come with our, as you said, honey, our own independent love for God and Mm -hmm. commitment to steadfastness with him. And then as God pairs us with other believers, they bring their commitment of steadfastness and intimacy with the Lord and submission to his lordship. So that way, when we come together, that's what's coming out of us, our own commitment Mm -hmm. and love and lordship, our, our commitment to the lordship of Jesus Christ. So that way we're not tainting each other right adam and eve both had to have their own commitment for it to work god paired them together but either one of them pulling to the left or the right caused the whole crowd right the the whole lump Mm. to be leavened by that little bit of leaven so as we are looking at the things of god let him minister to our hearts and make sure that we are first committed and then we commit to trusting god find him faithful When you recount him in your mind of situations and things that you've experienced, count God faithful in that. Don't say, well, God, you left me by myself and things of that nature because there's no truth in that because he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And Mm -hmm. even when we depart from him, he yet remains faithful to us. And the mercy of God that keeps us from reaping all the benefit of what our flesh sows, God has been merciful. God has been faithful. So Recount him as trustworthy, as somebody who deserves your trust and is able to not let you down or disappoint you, not because he does everything you want, but in him being righteous in who he is, he is a good God and he does what is good, righteous and holy and good for us as we trust him. And then let him join you up with believers that believe are going in the same direction towards him with all their might. Absolutely. And and I think that's also the, the key, right? In this message, he's not writing to every Roman, although every Roman, every person in Rome can benefit from the message. Excuse me. He is writing, and by he I mean Paul, right? But the Lord is first and foremost speaking to us, to Christians, to believers, to his body, to the bride of Christ, Mm -hmm. on how we should live and conduct ourselves and ultimately being conformed to the image of Christ. Amen. Right. That's right. just, and I really felt led to say it because there's a lot in this, and we're gonna, we are gonna cover it. This is like, a, I'll say, a part one of, of mm-hmm. this section, mm-hmm. right? Because there's a lot in here and a lot to cover, right? And all we covered thus far was was idolatry, if you will. Right? There's so many other, I'll say, issues and things that Paul addresses here, and some of it is is hard hitting, right? And it's not to convict people, if you will, the world, Mm -hmm. who have chosen to live in this way, he is writing to the church that we can address the things in our lives, those, and I'll say that, the church, the body of Christ, believers, the bride of Christ, those who profess to be followers of Christ, who are called 
And it's expected that we are being conformed to his image, the image mm-hmm. of Jesus. Amen. Right? That's who he's writing to. And if there's something in there that we don't have an alignment and agreement or, right, that doesn't bear, I'll say, witness with our spirit, but that convicts us, then we should address those things before Heavenly Father and repent and bring it back into alignment, Mm -hmm. being refined and purified so that people only see Christ in and through us, Mm -hmm. right? It's great, and it's necessary for everybody else as well. But at first, it's written for us. Amen. For those that are our believers, that profess to be followers of Christ. Yeah. Right? It, it says in Scripture that judgment first starts in the house. So it's written for us. So I, I'll leave us with that thought because or as we continue to go through these things, nothing of what we discuss is, is meant to shame or condemn or convict anyone. Even what we discussed today is never the intention. Mm-hmm. Right, but it's only that we can come into to the wisdom and the knowledge and understanding of Christ and his ways and his thoughts and to see things his way, right? And with his sight to understand those things. We should be learning those and moving forward in faith, of course. Amen? Amen. All right, so with that, can I get a volunteer to close out in prayer, please? I will. Lord, I just thank you for today, Lord. Just thank you for your Bible studies, Lord. Just thank you for giving us That's insight right. and information on your word, Lord, so that we can continue to grow in you, Lord, and that we're not just sitting there stagnant, Lord. Lord, I also just thank you for giving us each revelation so that way we can all share it, Lord, and grow as a group, Lord, and just have a deeper understanding of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we love you. God bless you. And have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to A Day of Prayer. We trust the Lord that you are strengthened and encouraged in your relationship with Christ. Visit us on our website, adayofprayer.org, where you can check out our blog, find additional study resources, or shop the official A Day of Prayer store. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So until next time, take care and God bless you.